On the evening of January 30th, 1649, the body of King Charles I of England was lying under black velvet in a room at Whitehall where Charles had spent the last days before his execution. That afternoon, Charles had been beheaded on a platform before an audience that included his chaplain, throngs of public spectators, and government troops called out in case the king should make a last-minute appeal to his people. Guarding the king's body were two of his noblemen, including the Earl of Southampton, both sitting nearby in a state of deep melancholy. According to tradition, at about 2 a.m., the men heard the footsteps of someone coming slowly up the stairs. In a moment, the door opened, and they saw a dark figure, closely muffled in his cape, with his face hidden. The visitor approached the body, gazed at the face of the dead king for some time, and then shook his head. With a sigh, he whispered, Cruel necessity. Then he left as quickly and quietly as he derived. Although the guards never saw the man's face, the Earl of Southampton had no doubt as to whom the distinctive voice and gait belonged. They belonged to Oliver Cromwell, the man who had overthrown the king and signed the order for his execution. The rise of a man like Oliver Cromwell and the fall of a king like Charles I could only have happened in this age of the mid-seventeenth century, when a revolutionary fever was sweeping almost all of Europe, and when England itself was ripped apart by religious and political dissension. Even then, it is a remarkable story that a modest and pious English gentleman, with no military background, could defeat the king's army, push through the trial and execution of his monarch, and become himself the leader of the United Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Yet Oliver Cromwell did just that, in a period of only ten years. Cromwell was born in Huntingdon, eastern England, April 25, 1599, the fifth of ten children. His family was well off and for many years had been serving as members of the British Parliament in the House of Commons. The Parliament consisted then, as it does now, of two houses— the House of Lords, whose members qualify just by right of their aristocratic birth, and the House of Commons, whose members are elected by the people. In his early life, Cromwell was strongly influenced by Protestantism, an influence that would play a major role in his future, and that of England. His parents were both Protestants, and two of his early teachers, first at grammar school and then at college, were devout Calvinists, whose views were strongly anti-Catholic. Cromwell attended only a year of college, then had to return home to take care of his mother and sisters upon the death of his father. As a young man, Cromwell was not particularly studious and much preferred to be outdoors, especially riding and hunting. He also gambled a little and had flirtations with women, which shocked the mostly Puritan population at his college. He was, however, an avid student of the Bible and liked to read Sir Walter Raleigh's book, The History of the World. One of his tutors at college had remarked that he was not so much addicted to speculation as to action. He spent a short time in London where he learned the basics of law, as was customary for country gentlemen, and then returned to the family estate. When he was twenty-one, he married Elizabeth Brochier, daughter of a London merchant. It appears not to have been a marriage of love, but one of convenience, which was traditional for the times. Nevertheless, they had nine children, five sons, and four daughters, and Cromwell seems to have been devoted to them. Throughout his career there were rumors of romances and mistresses, but there isn't much to support them, and most historians think the stories were contrived by his enemies. During the early years of his marriage, Cromwell involved himself in the local affairs of his county and struggled with financial woes. Like other members of the gentry, he had to deal with bad harvests and a variety of taxes imposed by the monarchy, not just to support the royal navy, but to pay for the lavish lifestyles at court. He had been elected a member of parliament when he was twenty-nine, but it was an office that wasn't worth much at the time. The king dissolved the parliament a year later and didn't call for another one for eleven more years. Most of Cromwell's energy during this period was taken up not by business and politics, but by an internal crisis that seemed both psychological and spiritual.
He wrestled with the increasing debts of his farms, a burden that wasn't resolved until an uncle left him a small fortune a few years later. And he seemed tormented by indiscretions, minor as they seem by modern standards, he'd committed in his loose college days. Somewhere between the ages of twenty-nine and thirty-one, he underwent a conversion that was searing both mentally and physically. He read and reread the Bible, memorized passages from the Old Testament, and suffered such agonies that he frequently called for the doctor in the middle of the night, convinced he was dying. In his notebook, this doctor remarked that his patient was exceedingly melancholy, and that he had given him a universal cure-all which had had no effect. Cromwell emerged from this crisis of body and soul, convinced he was one of God's chosen people, and that he had been transformed from one of the worst sinners in the world into a man who walked in the light of the Lord. From then on, everything he did, he felt, was divinely guided. Meanwhile, hundreds of miles away in London, Cromwell's future adversary sat on the throne of England and wondered what he could do to bring even more money into the royal treasury. Proud, handsome Charles I had been crowned in 1625 when Cromwell was twenty-six years old. He was a slim and elegant man, with long wavy hair to his shoulders, a pointed Van Dyke beard, a curly mustache, and jeweled earrings hanging from his aristocratic lobes. Charles was perpetually trying to get more money out of Parliament, sometimes to launch wars so he could take the wealth of other nations such as Spain, and sometimes just to finance his luxurious court. Charles had summoned the Parliament and asked them to raise taxes, a request that was denied. The Lords certainly didn't want to pay more taxes, although they were willing to let the farmers and businessmen pay more. But the House of Commons, which represented these businessmen, strongly objected on their behalf. Everyone was well aware that increases in taxes seldom benefited the nation, but greatly benefited the king and his friends, who built more and more beautiful palaces, and adorned themselves with elaborate clothes and jewels, while most of the people in England had barely enough to eat. Annoyed by Parliament's lack of cooperation, the king simply disbanded it and called for a new election. The second Parliament proved to be just as uncooperative as the first. Furious, King Charles dismissed that Parliament, too, and called for a third. In the meantime, he tried to borrow money and raise funds by other means. At one point, he set up a soap manufacturing monopoly, requiring the people of England to purchase soap from only one company, which in turn was required to share its profits with the Crown. This company steadily raised its prices while reducing the quality of the soap. Soon they were producing something that wasn't soap at all, and which not only failed to remove dirt, but added blisters for good measure. When the king refused to remedy the situation, there were soap riots all over England, and he lost the goodwill of a large percentage of his subjects. The profits from the soap monopoly still weren't adequate, so Charles confronted the third parliament and grimly warned them not to debate and criticize, but to simply supply the funds he needed to rule England. Again, he was refused. Exasperated and enraged, the king decided on a bold step. He would raise taxes without consent of Parliament. Suddenly he decreed that all merchants had to pay a duty called tonnage and poundage on any goods they imported from abroad. The cries of protest could be heard throughout England, and particularly in Parliament, where the powers and rights that citizens had fought for for centuries had all at once been denied them. Taxes weren't the only source of dispute in the realm of King Charles. Religion, too, was dividing the country. Many of the English had come to disapprove of the Church of England, also called the Anglican Church, which had been set up a hundred years before by King Henry VIII. It was, people felt, becoming too much like Roman Catholicism. These protesters wanted to purify the Church of its rituals and corruption. Thus they were called Puritans. Several were refusing to attend the Church of England, and had set up their own churches. Still others had migrated to America in search of greater religious freedom. The Puritans included everything from devout people who simply regarded the Bible as the highest authority, just as Martin Luther and John Calvin had, to extremists who condemned every kind of trivial behavior and prayed for hours every day. Cromwell belonged to a group of Puritans called Independents, 
who believed everyone had the right to worship God in their own way, without having to obey or pay taxes to the bishops of the Church of England. It was Cromwell's belief that each Christian could communicate with God through prayer, and that the principal duty of the clergy was its sermons. Because of this, he had contributed out of his own pocket to the support of preachers, and was an outspoken opponent of bishops of the Church of England, of ritual and church authority. King Charles had tried to force the Puritans to join the Church of England, and when many of their leaders had refused, he ordered their ears cut off. This was the stage of turmoil and unrest into which Oliver Cromwell entered in the 1630s as a member of the House of Commons, a landowner who had suffered the heavy taxes of the monarchy, and a Puritan who strongly supported religious freedom and opposed the supremacy of the Church of England. Cromwell was tall and strong, with a rather homely face. He had a large, bulbous nose, a prominent wart on his forehead, and an even larger one in the middle of his chin. He was neither vain nor modest. Mostly, he was honest. In later years, when he sat for a portrait painter, who was famous for how he made all his noble subjects appear handsome and beautiful, Cromwell told him, I desire you would use all your skill to paint my picture truly like me, and not flatter me at all, but remark all these roughnesses, pimples, warts, and everything as you see me. Otherwise I will never pay a farthing for it. Staring out from his rather roughly hewn face were a pair of keen, bright eyes. His expression was serious, almost stern. Cromwell had a harsh voice and wasn't the most eloquent speaker, but he put so much feeling into his words that in Huntingdon he had been known for the moving way he led people in prayer and hymns. Cromwell always held himself erect and had the dignified manner that distinguished a country squire. The great battle between Oliver Cromwell and King Charles I began at first in the House of Commons. Because of revolts spreading throughout England, and especially in Protestant Scotland, Charles decided he had to raise a new and stronger army. When he sought large loans from bankers and then from nobles, they both responded that they would do so only if Parliament approved, for they feared reprisal. It was the king's hope that he could get his money from Parliament, and then send it away again, as he'd done so many times in the past. Aware of his plans, members of Parliament, including Cromwell, required him to first sign a law saying the Parliament couldn't be dissolved except by its own consent. The second condition was that the money couldn't be used for war against the Scots. Finally, they demanded that he grant them the right to raise troops, for they feared he might send his own troops against them, claiming they were in a state of rebellion. Instead of responding to his demand, Charles ordered several hundred soldiers to invade the House of Commons and arrest the leaders who had spoken against him on grounds of treason. Cromwell was not yet prominent enough to be among those arrested, but that was all soon to change. King Charles, determined to strengthen his army, rode north to solicit volunteers and donations of gold and silver from the nobility all over England and Scotland. While he was gone, the House of Commons erupted into passionate debate and endless speeches about what to do about this king who had become a dictator. As they talked and talked, Charles' army grew larger, and Cromwell grew more and more impatient. Finally, he appealed to Parliament to allow him to raise two companies of volunteers, and permission was granted. Then Captain Cromwell set out on a civil war. He was already forty-three years old, but Oliver Cromwell threw himself into the cause of rebellion with all the vigor and strength he had. He was fighting for his religion and for his political rights as an Englishman. It was, so he told his son Oliver, God's battle. Young Oliver was recruited as a soldier, and when he died later in battle, Cromwell locked himself up in his rooms for hours, with his face buried in his hands, praying. The first thing Cromwell's army did was seize the king's arsenal, and the second thing it did was seize all the gold and silver they could to prevent it from being donated to the king. Soon, Cromwell's companies had become part of a 14,000-member army assembled by Parliament and commanded by the Earl of Essex. Their first battle was a defeat. The king's cavalry of young gentlemen had trained from youth to ride and use weapons and had a code of honor that never allowed them to retreat. The ordinary workmen and shop folk in the parliamentary army were no match.
Cromwell learned from the defeat. He began to wonder where he could come up with men as brave and disciplined as the king's cavaliers. And then the answer came to him. He would raise a regiment of Puritans, men dedicated to God, who would go into battle singing hymns, and who were as willing to die for their religion as the king's men were for their honor. For months, Cromwell recruited such men until he had an entire regiment, so daring and strong that it was nicknamed Ironsides. He demanded good treatment and regular pay for his soldiers, but he also exercised strict discipline. If they swore, they were fined. If they drank, they were put in the stocks. If they called each other roundheads, the name the royalists had given them because of their close-cropped hair, they were dismissed in disgrace. He trained his regiment so well that he was able to check and reform them after they charged into battle, one of his outstanding gifts as a commander. It is Cromwell who made the famous remark while leading his troops across a river to attack the enemy, Put your trust in God, but mind you, keep your powder dry. Within a year he had won so many critical battles that he was promoted to lieutenant general. He managed this without any military training or experience but by carefully studying the strategies of other military leaders in history and by his own natural talents. Although Cromwell's regiment was doing well and never lost a major battle, other regiments of the Parliament, led by the Earls of Essex and Manchester, were suffering defeat. Cromwell knew the Earls had no military skill, and he became convinced that the rebels would never be victorious unless he was in command, and Essex and Manchester were removed. He took his case to Parliament, where fiery debates broke out among the followers of all three men. Finally, Parliament passed an ordinance that no man could serve in Parliament and as an officer at the same time. Essex, Manchester, and Cromwell all gave up their commands. Then a general named Sir Thomas Fairfax, not a member of Parliament, was made the new commander-in-chief. The general, who had the experience to recognize military talent when he saw it, promptly appointed Cromwell lieutenant general again, for the ordinance passed by Parliament had said nothing about being reappointed to a post. Cromwell went back to work, making sure as usual that his regiments were well-fed, well-disciplined, and united in spirit. This new model army, as he called it, steadily drove back the royalist forces until the king was forced to surrender. In 1647, he was put under guard at the palace with the plan that he would be returned to the throne when he agreed to the settlements with the Parliament that gave them control of taxes and troops. Cromwell didn't think it would be advantageous to return Charles to the throne, but he didn't openly oppose it. Instead, he shifted his concern to the issue dividing Parliament, the issue of religion. Most members of Parliament supported the idea of making Presbyterianism the official religion of England, instead of the Anglican Church. Cromwell opposed the idea of making any religion the official one, and hoped to get rid of the Church of England altogether. The Presbyterian majority, afraid of Cromwell's power, ordered that his army be disbanded. Then, because their treasury was empty, they sent the soldiers home without pay, and with a false promise that they would pay some time in the future. These actions so enraged and depressed Cromwell that he briefly considered leaving England and joining the Protestant fight in Germany or emigrating to America. Then he came up with a different plan. He would stay and fight. Instead of disbanding his army, he gave them orders to march on London, telling Parliament it was only to protect it from the London mobs which had been gathering outside Parliament demanding certain laws. More frightened of Cromwell's army than the mobs, Parliament granted him two concessions. He could keep his regiment, and he himself could make the terms of peace with the king. An agreement between the self-serving king of England and the missionary rebel from Parliament never seemed like a serious possibility from the start. They had two interviews in which Cromwell tried to reach a settlement over a constitution they could then submit to Parliament. At this point, Cromwell felt no animosity towards the king and was even touched by Charles' devotion to his children. But discussions had barely begun when King Charles escaped and headed to Scotland where he hoped he could raise new troops. The Presbyterians in Scotland had become angry when Parliament refused to set up a Presbyterian Church of England, and now they were ready to switch sides and join the Royalists. When Cromwell heard of the King's escape, he summoned his regiments, called his officers to him, 
and then rode off for what became known as the Second Civil War. He won battle after battle until the Scottish troops, sure now of their defeat, betrayed the king and sold him to the English as a prisoner. After Charles' flight, Cromwell lost all hope of dealing with him through reason and persuasion. He called the king an obstinate man whose heart God had hardened. The Second War won. He returned to Parliament and to the battles that awaited him there. In Parliament, the arguments waged on and on about what settlement they should make with Charles, while Cromwell, sick of having to even consider the troublesome monarch, asked, Are we to have just a little bit of paper for all our fighting? Finally, when he could stand the endless bickering no more, he marched some of his troops into Parliament and removed all but the sixty men who supported him. Those sixty became known in history as the Rump Parliament. The first thing they did was try the king for treason. When the king refused to make a plea in his case, they condemned him to be beheaded. Cromwell signed the death warrant. While Charles lived, there would always be royalists willing to fight for him, and England would never know peace. That, at least, is what Cromwell believed. Charles went to his death with dignity, saying, I go from a corruptible crown to an incorruptible crown, where no disturbance can be, no disturbance in the world. When the axe descended, up from the crowd came a great deep groan, said an eyewitness, as I never heard before, and I desire I may never hear again. The groan was one of lament, not just for the king, but for the whole shocking state of the country. While the execution was taking place, Cromwell was deep in prayer at a prayer meeting with his closest associates. The king's servants were denied permission to bury his body in Westminster Abbey, and instead Charles was taken to Windsor, where he was interred in the same vault that held the ruthless King Henry VIII. Burial was attended by a few faithful friends, who were not allowed to read from the Book of Common Prayer, as Charles would have liked, because it was the official book of the Church of England. In many ways, the death of the king was only the beginning of Cromwell's problems. Next, he had to defeat a new political party called the Levellers, who, true to their name, wanted everybody in England to be equal in rank and wealth, ideas that were somewhat similar to the socialism that developed a few centuries later. Then he had to put down rebel armies in Ireland and Scotland and direct a victorious war against Holland, which was controlling trade on the seas. And, of course, there were more problems with Parliament, this time with his own specially chosen rump group, which began to make itself wealthy with political bribes and favors. Appalled by the lack of integrity, as was the public, Cromwell suggested that Parliament disband itself and hold a new election. The most he could get from them was a promise they'd have an election in a few years. There were problems with money, too. To replenish the treasury, Parliament was confiscating property from royalists and selling it to businessmen, destroying many honest men and is in the process. Again, Cromwell demanded a new election. This time, Parliament agreed but only on the condition that current members could remain without being elected, and that a few new elected members could be added. This demand infuriated Cromwell. A few days later, when he heard they were going to pass this election law without him, he stormed into Parliament, yelled and screamed a while, called them corrupt and unjust men and scandalous to the profession of the gospel, and finally announced, We have had enough of this. I'll put an end to your prating. You shall give place to better men. Call them in. And with that, in came his troops. When the troops entered, Cromwell picked up the mace on the Speaker's table, a symbol of Parliament's authority, and made his now famous statement. Take this bauble away! The frightened members of Parliament were ushered out the door, and Oliver Cromwell was leader of England. The government of Cromwell, which has often been called a dictatorship, had no constitutional basis, and from the beginning was based on his own prestige and personality. At first, he didn't admit he was an absolute ruler. In fact, he summoned a new parliament, this time made up of religious men elected by the independent churches of England. It was called, facetiously by some, the Parliament of Saints. 
Unfortunately, its members were more experienced with the Bible than with lawmaking, and disgusted by their incompetence and their radical views, Cromwell sent them home. He later described his experiment in choosing so-called saints to govern as an example of his own weakness and folly. Next, he selected a group of trusted supporters, and after what they described as much seeking of God by prayer, they elected Cromwell ruler for life, with the more benign title, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The election stipulated that he would be helped by a council of state and parliament, which had to be called every three years. When people protested, Cromwell responded that he was doing it for England's sake to prevent further civil war. As often happens in history, as soon as Cromwell was in office, he began to resemble the very man he'd overthrown, King Charles. When the Catholics in Ireland proclaimed Charles' son, Prince Charles Stuart, the king, Cromwell swept through Ireland mercilessly slaughtering thousands of its inhabitants, whom he called barbarous wretches and heathens. He took possession of much of the island, driving Catholic landowners into the mountains. He waged war against Spain, just as Charles had planned, and gained new colonies for Britain. But war, as King Charles had known, was a costly venture. So Cromwell increased taxes, so much so that many of his supporters turned against him and began to plot with the royalists who hoped to bring Prince Charles to the throne. Certain religious extremists and revolutionaries even conspired to kill him. More and more, Cromwell relied on his soldiers and spies to protect him. He set up a military government which prosecuted and punished his opponents. Even judges who failed to interpret the law by his wishes were sent to prison. His most dangerous opponents were sent to the colonies or executed. Eventually, Cromwell's parliament, which was made of his most faithful supporters, sent him a petition urging him to become king and name his successor. On one hand, the idea appealed to Cromwell. He'd hoped to find some way to guarantee that his son Richard Cromwell could succeed him as Lord Protector. But he knew the idea was unpopular with his army, which had already fought to depose one king and had no desire to see another take his place. Furthermore, many of them were opposed to a monarchy on religious grounds, wanting no king but God. So Cromwell refused the crown. Instead, he launched a program to regain the trust and love of the English people. He lowered taxes a little and gave the businessmen and landowners he'd alienated titles of nobility. He terminated the military government and installed a trial-by-jury system. Cromwell was strongly opposed to severe punishments for minor crimes, saying, To see men lose their lives for petty matters is a thing that God will reckon for. He supported the death penalty only for murder, treason, and rebellion. One of the changes made under Cromwell's leadership was the nation's new coinage. One side of the new coins read, God with us, and the other side read, The Republic of England. A royalist, upon first seeing the coin, dryly remarked, Quite proper that God and the Republic should be on different sides. Cromwell was often cruel and tyrannical, but he made many contributions to England. He helped build a superb army and a large navy that caused the Commonwealth to be recognized as a great power in Europe. He aided the development of English colonies in Asia and North America. At home, he established a broad church with complete freedom for Christians who wished to worship outside it. Despite opposition from his council, he allowed Jews to settle in England for the first time since 1290, almost 400 years. Although he was a devout Puritan, Cromwell was less rigid than many. He himself took delight in music and liked to listen to the organ. He was known to smoke, to drink sherry and beer, and to enjoy food, if it was English. He even permitted dancing at the wedding of his youngest daughter. Some think that the reforms Cromwell made were a design to gain the trust of his army, so that he could safely be named king later. History will never be sure, for in the middle of these reforms he became ill. In 1658, after his favorite daughter Elizabeth died of cancer, he came down with malaria 
Cromwell died on September 3rd at the age of 59 in Whitehall, where he had once gazed upon the body of King Charles I. He was buried with much honor and ceremony in Westminster Abbey, but he was not to rest there for long. Cromwell's death heralded the collapse of the Commonwealth and the restoration of the monarchy. His son Richard was named Lord Protector, but he was a weak leader and gladly gave up the position soon after. After a few years of confusion, when the economy of the country deteriorated and rebellion seemed inevitable, the Stuart Prince was invited to take the throne by common consent of most of the English people. After years of debate, hardship, war, and death, England was right back where it started, with an extravagant king who had little respect for Parliament or for religious freedom. One of the first acts of King Charles II was to have the corpse of Oliver Cromwell disinterred, hanged at Tyburn where criminals were executed, and beheaded. His body was then buried beneath the gallows, but his head was stuck on a pole atop Westminster Hall, where it remained throughout the reign of Charles II. Oliver Cromwell was one of the most important figures in British history. Through his surprising military ability, his genius for organization and sheer force of character, he was able to overthrow a corrupt and selfish monarch and restore political stability after the civil wars. He then raised his country's status to a level it hadn't seen since the reign of Elizabeth I. England gained new national prestige under Cromwell, but perhaps even more importantly, it developed a model for religious tolerance that would influence it for generations to come. Although the monarchy returned, the memory of religious freedom never left. This freedom, which Cromwell so energetically fought for, was even more remarkable in view of his own strong Puritan and Calvinist beliefs. Unlike other religious crusaders, he never insisted that people adopt his own faith, only that they have the liberty to pursue the faith of their choosing. From the very beginning, it was his sense of duty to God that motivated him, and politics was secondary. And from this sense of duty, he derived the steadfast will that reshaped a nation for a period that, although brief, has never been forgotten.